What makes a person a Christian? Is it saying a few prayers? Attending church every once in a while? Being on your best behavior? Or is it something deeper? Sometimes it can be hard to tell where real faith lies until something happens, until someone is faced with the practical choice of where to place their hope. Let's dive in. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. Just a heads up, this episode contains content that may not be appropriate for our younger listeners. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing you the story of a man who took faith for granted and watched his life slowly descend into chaos in this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Be sure to stick around to the end of the podcast because today we're announcing the winner of the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast sweepstakes. But for now, let's get to it, folks. Part one of the true story of Ernie Scott. Stay focused. There's still ten more minutes for church starts. All right, we just read the parable of the sower. Some seeds fell on the path, and the birds ate it up. Some seeds fell among the rocks, and they died. Uh, other seeds started to grow, but the weeds choked them. And then some seeds grew deep and produced a big harvest. Got it? Okay, let's move on to the next parable. Um, hey, Ernie, what's so important about these parables? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? I'm still in high school. Come on, I'm just following the list your teacher gave me when she asked me to cover your class while she's away. Does anyone here know what parables are? Any guesses? Pastor Jeff said Jesus told parables because people were ignoring the plain words of the Bible. They need illustrations to help them understand God's words better. Uh, uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Someone read the next parable, which is in... But, uh, what do the seeds represent? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, does anyone here know? Anyone? I think the seeds are God's word, and the soil represents our heart. The birds are like the devil. The stony soil... Maybe the troubles of the world? The weeds are... are things that compete for God's attention, you know, like the love of money, and the good soil is what happens when we obey God. How do you know all this stuff? It's what Jesus says. It's all in there. The parable wants us to ask what kind of soil our hearts are like. Okay, okay, that's a signal head upstairs. Remember, hey, no running. Hey, Amanda, Amanda. Thanks for bailing me out this morning. You're pretty smart for a 12-year-old. Thanks. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What's up? I'm curious. What kind of heart do you have? I mean, are you a Christian? Of course I am. Everybody who goes to church is, aren't they? I don't know. I guess only God knows for sure. Some people believe that church membership is what earns their way to heaven. It doesn't matter what they do the rest of the week, as long as they show up and recite a few prayers. That's what the young man in our story believed until some bad decisions led to far-reaching consequences. We now bring you part one in the true testimony of Ernie Scott, right now on Unshackled. I bet you a dollar he can't reach the top of the rope. What's the matter, Ernie? You run out of gas? Hurry up, Dumbo. People are waiting. Hey, Tubby, what's taking you so long? Hey, hey, let's grab the end of the rope and shake him off. Come on, guys, leave him alone. This is the worst day of my life. Time's up, Ernie. Come on down. And don't hurt yourself. It's all right, Coach. I, I just didn't have um enough strength to get... uh. That was the sorriest thing I have ever seen. Uh, I said I get a B for trying, though, right? You get an F for no effort. <laughs> Listen up, people. Once you finish the rope climb, you can head to the locker room. All right. Who's next? It's not funny, Joe. I didn't say anything. No, no, but you were thinking about it. You have to admit, you look pretty funny up there hugging that rope. I know, I was there. 
The only kid in school who's failing gym class is he can't climb a stupid rope. Nah, that won't happen. Coach gives everyone a C if they just show up to class. I hope you're right. What's going on with you? You've been in a funk all day. I don't know. I... Okay, some kid asked me a question at church yesterday, and I can't stop thinking about it. Well, stop thinking about it, and let's just have some fun. My parents are working tonight. You want to go for a ride in my dad's old pickup? Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Anything's better than staying home. Not being athletic in gym class was the least of my problems at school. My grades were horrible. Nobody realized it at the time, but I struggled with ADHD and dyslexia, which caused me to see words upside down or backwards. So every time I struggled to read out loud, my classmates would just burst out in laughter. And whenever we had a test, I was always the last person to finish. Plus, I was shorter than most kids my age and almost as round as I was tall. We lived 27 miles from the school, which meant we never attended school activities or sports. We were always on the outside of everything that took place in our farm and community. The only excitement in my life was when Joe and I would go joyriding. Get ready, Ernie. There's another mailbox up ahead. Ernie steps to the plate and leans out the window. He grips his trusty two-by-four. He waits for his opportunity. And he swings! <laughs> ah, man! That's the third one I've missed. <laughs> ah, I'm thirsty. Hey, you got any beer left? Nah, I drank the last bottle. Uh-oh, quick. Throw the empties out the window. There's a car up ahead. Looks like it stopped. I don't see anybody. Me neither. Look. Oh, the front tire's flat. Nobody's here. They must say to ride in the town. Pop the latch and lift the hood while I get my wrench. What do you need tools for? I'm taking the battery. It's not yours, Joe. Losers, weepers, finders, keepers. I do this all the time. There's a garage that buys them from me. What if you get caught? Look around you, there's nobody here. No one will ever know. Dad, I'm sorry, okay? It's no big deal. Oh, really? Getting pulled out of class by a state trooper isn't a big deal? What did he say to you? <sighs> he asked me if I knew about the other car batteries at Joe's store, but I didn't know anything. That's the truth. Well, I talked to his parents. They agreed to make restitution for everything he stole. You got lucky, young man. Lucky? I didn't do anything and the school placed me on probation for a year! I hate my life! Where are you going? I'm going for a walk. The only place you're going is up to your room. You're grounded for the next month. Eventually the house rules relaxed and I started going out on weekends again, drinking with friends, lying to my parents about it. One night I borrowed my mom's car and got really drunk. On my way home, there was a little hill that was about 30 feet straight up. You know, the kind you speed over so you can come up off the car seat. And that night I crested that hill so fast, I flipped the car over backwards, crushed the roof, and broke my left arm in the process. My parents were um, not very happy. Neither was I, because it meant I had to ride the school bus for the rest of the year. Somehow I managed to graduate and found a job in the next state. I spent everything I earned on getting drunk every chance I had. Life was one big party, until I received a letter informing me I was being drafted into the army. Sorry, man, that means there's a good chance they'll send you to Vietnam. Yeah, that's what worries me. But if I enlist somewhere else, there's a chance I won't go there. What are you thinking, Air Force, Coast Guard? I'll try the Navy first. Dude, you weigh over 220 pounds, you'll sink their boat. It's very funny. I'm just joking with you. Whatever you do, just stay away from the Marines. I hear their boot camp is brutal. The next day, I went to the recruitment office to enlist. Joe was right. The Navy recruiter informed me I was too overweight and they didn't want me. What I didn't know was that another recruiter was listening to our conversation the whole time. Your name's Ernie, right? Yes, sir. Come on over to my cubicle. Have a seat. <laughs> nice uniform. We're the best of the best, son. I heard the Navy recruiter rejected you because of your weight. Yeah, what can I say? Uh, told me to go on a diet and try again in six months. Why wait that long? I'll take you just the way you are. You serious? I am. All I need is your signature on this paper, and you'll be on a bus this afternoon heading to North Carolina. We'll put you on a special program to help you lose that weight, at your own pace, while we slowly introduce some physical training. We even offer free haircuts whenever you need one. What do you say? Sounds great. Where do I sign? Right here, son. 
right here. Perfect. Let me get your bus voucher and you'll be on your way. Welcome to the Marines, son. What did I get myself into? Boot camp was brutal. I spent two months eating a fat body diet, running extra miles every day. But by the time I finished basic training, I had lost 30 pounds. Next, they sent me to heavy equipment repair school. I was eventually assigned to ships in the Caribbean where I continued to drink way too much with my Marine buddies. Two years later, I was discharged and moved near the Canadian border where I hung out with other vets. We drove trucks for the pulpwood mills and smoked pot and dropped acid nearly every day. During this time, I met a young lady who caught my eye. I was 24. She was 17 when we got married. I had no idea what I was getting into. Neither did she. I mean it, Ernie. I'm not going to tolerate your drinking anymore. I hardly ever drink. Okay, okay, look. Maybe one or two beers at night to relax. But not nearly as much as some guys I know. Are you serious? Go look in the trash can outside and count the number of empty cans and bottles in there. And that's not counting how many you have with the boys after work. You have a problem, Ernie. Okay. Maybe I drink more than I realize. I'll cut back. I promise. Oh, you'll do more than that if you don't want to lose me. <laughs> you don't mean that. Oh, you bet I do. Hey! I'm watching that! You either quit drinking or I'm out of here. Okay. Okay. I promise. No more beer. Get my promise about the beer, but she didn't say anything about smoking weed. I just replaced the beer with pot, and sometimes I'd smoke 20 joints a day. I was so busy with work that I didn't realize our relationship was in trouble. Four years into the marriage, I discovered she was sleeping with other truck drivers from the paper mill where we delivered pulp wood. I was furious. I even thought about driving my truck off the road because of the pain and hurt I felt. One night, I found her eating dinner in another town with some guy. I punched the man and dragged her back to the truck. There was no excuse for my violent reaction that night, but that was the final straw for her. She packed her bags and left me. I made lots of stupid mistakes back then, but I had no idea my biggest mistake was yet to come. Folks, we'll get back to Ernie's story in just a moment, but first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 73rd year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org. And then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled. We take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, back to Ernie Scott's story. A couple years later, I met and married a wonderful woman named Dora. We had our struggles, but that came later. The next part of my story involves this old guy, Harry Burton. Everybody loved Harry. He owned this junkyard that had over 500 old trucks in it, some of them going back to the 1920s. And if I ever needed an engine part, he knew exactly where to find it. Hey, Ernie, how's it going? Hanging in there, Mr. B. I stopped by last week, but you were closed. I didn't know if you were in the hospital or the funeral home. <laughs> I'm still here. I was on a mission trip with my church last week, helped some families down in Selma, Alabama. You and that church of yours. You're always helping people. Uh, is it okay if I go out back and look for some truck parts? Sure, but if you need something, you better buy it quick. Why? What's going on? I've decided to donate the business and my land to the church. They'll auction off the trucks and all the proceeds for their mission programs. There's just too many needs out there to ignore them. I'm ready to retire so I can do more mission work. You've had this place your whole life. They're just trucks, Ernie. And I'm older than all of them. 
There's more important things in life than just collecting stuff and watching it all turn to rust. It's provided a good income, but people matter more than any job does. It's time for me to let go of this place. What if I bought it from you? You could still give your church the money and I can stop driving lumber trucks for a living. I already know every inch of this place. What do you say? Will you sell it to me? I bought his business and spent the next 20 years selling off what Harry had spent his entire life collecting and hoarding. Some guys would have been satisfied with the income I had, but not me. I was willing to do whatever it took to make as much money as I could. And I was even willing to risk my family if I had to. I'm telling you, Ernie, you gotta meet this guy. Bob's smarter than both of us combined. He thinks your property could produce a lot more income with a metal recycling business. Maybe so, but I don't have that kind of cash to invest. I need truck scales, compactors, forklifts. He'll put up all the capital you need for a piece of the business. All you have to do is operate it. Oh, simple as that, eh? Come on, man. The nearest competition is over an hour away. What do you have to lose? And I still operate the business? Yeah, he'll just be a minority owner. A silent partner. Trust me on this one. He's already invested in my business. This guy will make both of us rich. I don't know. I better run this past my wife first. She hates surprises. Mm. I thought you wore the pants in your family. I do. But it might be good for both of us to meet this guy. She's a good judge of character and- And what, I'm not? No, that's not what I mean. Do you want to make money or don't you? Because this guy only offers once and then he moves on. That's the way he is. He's calling me tonight. What do you want me to tell him? I met Bob the next week and signed the investment agreement he had typed up. And since he was the one investing all the cash, he said it was only reasonable that he become the CEO of the new corporation. And like a fool, I just nodded my head and went along with his plan. Not once did it dawn on me to consult a lawyer first or ask where all of his money was coming from. A year later, I learned he made most of his money from selling marijuana crops. After every harvest, he'd buy more equipment for the businesses he co-owned and expect the other owner to pay for half of it. And when they couldn't pay, he'd take another percentage of their business away from them. This guy was a liar and a cheat, and I hated him for it. To make matters worse, my silent partner started showing up every day at my business. Get over here, Ernie. We need to talk. What's up? I gave you a list yesterday of all the things I want to change around here. How come none of them are done? I'll get to them once I finish some other projects. That's not how things work around here. I'm the boss, and you'll do it when I tell you to do it. You understand? You're my business partner. You're not my boss. And if I want... Ah! Uh, what's the matter, tough guy? You can't take a punch to the chest? Why'd you hit me? Because I'm the boss, and I'll punch anybody who talks back at me. I own this business. No, you don't! Oh, yeah? Read the papers you signed. My investment gives me total control. So just like the Marine Corps, you'll keep your mouth shut and do what you're told. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> he was right. He had manipulated everything until he was in total control. As CEO, he even transferred the trucks I owned into his name only. I was the frog in the proverbial kettle. I didn't realize it until it was too late. Being around him was like walking on eggshells. One day he was Mr. Tough Guy, and then the next, he acted like my best friend. Every time he showed up, I felt my body tense up. I never knew what to expect. All right, here's the list of what needs to be done today. By the way, how are you and your wife making out? All the bills getting paid? My wife works, we get by. But you can always use some extra cash in your pockets, right? Maybe. Hey, I got a deal for you. I need help harvesting the marijuana crop. I'll pay you six grand if you help Brian bring it in. Do I have a choice? <laughs> Not really. I'm the boss, remember? Yeah. You're the boss. Brian knows where all the plants are. And when the job's done, you'll get your cash. Good thing you wore your tall boots. You'll need them. Fields are dry. You haven't had any rain in weeks. He plants in remote areas like high ground in the middle of a swamp. It's never just one field. Too easy to be spotted by the cops. It'll take the whole weekend to harvest these plants. So, how much is the boss paying you? Six grand. It's a lot more than I expected. You know how much he'll make from us harvesting this marijuana crop? 600k at least. 
You and I do all the grunt work, and we each get 1%. Why am I not surprised? He gets fat, and all we get are the crumbs. We're not the only ones. He's cheated a dozen friends of mine, stolen their businesses right from under them, you included. Sorry I ever introduced you to him. He didn't know what he was like. He fooled everybody. I've never hated anyone as much as I hate that man. One of these days, someone's gonna put a bullet through that stupid smile of his. Yeah, somebody needs to do it. And the sooner the better. Could you pull the trigger? Me? Yeah. You got enough guts to shoot him? I don't know, maybe. Could you do it? Yeah, I'd do it. I'd do it in a heartbeat. If I had a gun. I, uh, got a gun in my office. Let me know if you ever want it. Okay. How about tomorrow night, after we get paid? Why not? I'm tired of him bossing me around. I'll pick you up after dark. It's amazing how easy it is to justify taking someone's life. Hate holes at your mind until it convinces you that the wrong thing to do is the right thing to do. The temptation to pay someone back for all the wrong they had done kept me awake that night. I could have turned my back on it. I could have asked my wife to talk some sense into me. I didn't want to. Years later, someone showed me this verse from the book of James. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Brings forth death. The more I thought of killing Bob, the more convinced I was that he deserved to die. But when you murder someone, a part of you dies too. Your integrity, your freedom. None of that went through my mind back then. Only one thing did. I wanted to kill him. That's his place there. It looks like he's not home. He will be. That's where you have to drop on him when he does get here. Ambush. I like it. You gun loaded? Yeah. Five bullets. I double checked. We only need one. All right. Just remember the trigger pull is light. Got it. And do not drop my gun after. Keep it with you. All right. Do you want to do it? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Don't get rattled. I go down, you go down. Yeah, yeah. And tonight, that greedy fool is going down. Nice and easy, Steve. If you try to kill the king, you best not miss. You're home late. Steve? What are you doing in my... What is that, a gun? <laughs> you ain't got this. Join us again next week when we'll hear the conclusion of this story. Listening friend. Like Ernie... Your anger towards someone may consume you. But when we take justice into our own hands, the consequences can be more than we bargain for. Only with the help of God can we truly forgive those who harm us. Only when we admit how much God has forgiven us are we able to fully extend that grace to others. It all begins with a relationship with Jesus. When we ask him to forgive our sins, when we believe that he took the punishment we deserved by dying on the cross. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 promise that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you need help in making this crucial decision, we encourage you to call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Or you can get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform. Unshackled Daily Devotionals, and Unshackled in Person. 
We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, it's the moment you've been waiting for. It's time to announce the winner of the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast Sweepstakes. Now, to remind everyone of the prize, it is a beautiful scripture plaque with 2 Chronicles 16.9 written on a gorgeous piece of natural wood. And our winner is, drumroll, Michael Valerius from Bluegrass, Iowa. Well, congrats to our big winner. We hope you enjoy this daily reminder of God's truth. When you find the best spot to hang it up, post a picture to Facebook or Instagram and tag Unshackled PGM. We'll start a new drawing for our new plaque to give everyone another chance to win a scripture plaque next week. And next time... Have you seen the news? Yeah, it's on all the channels. Reporters are saying it was a house robbery that went bad. We keep to our story, right? Yep. We played cards at your house, drank some beers, and I went home around midnight. Whatever you do, stick to the story and don't change any details. What do you say if the cops come around? Um, I'll tell them that I hated the man, and I hope they never catch the guy that shot him. Ernie Scott committed a horrible crime, which he hid for many years. Ernie, you've got to tell me what's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Yes, there is, and I want to know what it is. Ever since Bob's murder, you've been a different person. Tell me what's going on. Nothing. Leave me alone. Only after he's sent to prison does he find the forgiveness he was searching for. I've made a big mess in my life. I may not have pulled the trigger, but I sure murdered that man in my heart. Don't miss part two of this powerful story of redemption and the true testimony of Ernie Scott on the next Unshackled. Heard in part one of the true story of Ernie Walter Scott were Patrick Thompson, Angela Morris, Kurt Nabig, Brian Plaharchik, and Demetrius Troy. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Audio engineer, David Pierczynski. Script, Scott Kirk. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. 